Good evening, everyone. Wow, quite a packed chamber. Uh, welcome to tonight's much, much anticipated event. Tonight, we'll be joined by Malala Yousafzai. Malala is a Pakistani activist for women's education, author, and human rights advocate who has been dubbed Pakistan's most prominent citizen. In 2014, she was made the youngest ever Nobel Peace Prize laureate at 17 years old and is the first Pashtun uh, to receive this accolade. She graduated from Lady Margaret Hall in 2020 and has been a global icon inspiring millions of young people around the world. It gives me great pleasure and an honor to welcome Malala Yousafzai into our chamber tonight. Firstly, it's such an honor, firstly, sitting here. And I've never seen a more electric crowd in this chamber in, in the last two, three years. Um, it's, it's such a great honor uh, to have you back in Oxford. Um, I mean, you left yourself only a few years ago. Uh, you graduated a few years ago from Oxford. And one thing that I was thinking about, uh, and I think a lot of people must have thought about this, that it must have been quite different, quite odd, being such a high profile person, like going through the same university experiences. Um, so essentially, like, how did you find the university experience? And uh, balancing that with your activism like, and studies, you get essay crisis every week, essentially. Uh, so did you feel a lot of pressure on day to day, or how was it? That's a lot of questions, but first of all, I'm so honored to be here at Oxford Union. Um, yes, I was having a really good time here at university. Uh, I visited the union so many times. I sat almost in every corner of this building, up there, <laughs> there, there, here, left, right, everywhere, just trying all the seats. I said, which one gives you the best view? So, um, yeah, I think these front ones are good. So, I, you know, I, um, I started studying here in 2017 and then graduated in uh, 2020, uh, the first COVID, uh, you know, class. And I had the best time here because I was able to meet some of the most amazing people. I was able to um, hear some inspiring leaders, change makers, policy makers, uh, most in, in this same very building. And uh, I also made amazing friends uh, in, in my college. And uh, I think one of the best thing, things was like, I went to LMH, Lady Margaret Hall. So that's the, <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, it's, it's probably the best college here. So I'm sure, I, I, the, I'm I, sure the, the president would agree, so. No, I completely agree. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, also, this was all pre-planned. Malala voted for me to, so I could become president and invite her back to Oxford. Uh, but <laughs> anyways, we don't talk about that. Um, but what, what would you say, like, you missed the most about Oxford? Just, I, I just want to know a bit about, like, how your time was here. I'm curious, because I wasn't here. I'll be honest, I do not look back. I always try to focus on the next things in my life. When I graduated from university, there were just so many things to reflect on, all the good memories, all the difficult times, those essay crises, uh, those moments of nearly giving up and deciding like, this is too hard, this is too uh, challenging. And because I was doing activism and so much work outside, it was quite challenging to manage all the work together and, and you know, you all know that the, just meeting, you know, all all the essay deadlines and finishing those reading lists, like that's nearly impossible. So, uh, so it's 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 not an easy time here. Uh, but I try to carry those beautiful memories with me, the time I spent with my friends, the, all the giggles and laughters we had, and the time we spent in the uh, beautiful libraries, gardens, and but I think, you know, there's, there's so much you learn here, uh, but also at the same time you realize that, you know, Oxford at the same time has limits as well. It has, uh, 
you know, it does not truly reflect the world outside. So you have met amazing and incredible people, stay in touch with them and make the best friends and go forward and try to bring your vision into, uh, into action, try to make it a reality. I'm really grateful that I have a group of friends who are doing so much amazing projects. They are uh, raising awareness, they are empowering other people, they are, um, they are you know, bringing new innovative ways to create change, uh, and they are ensuring that other people also get equal opportunities uh, to be able uh, to study and to, and, and, and to have um, you know, their, their a better future for themselves. Mm -hmm. So that is something that I really uh, am, am grateful for, that I made amazing friends, uh, and I'm sure you know, they, uh, they, they stay with you forever. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely, and I, I think it's it's quite an enjoyable time. I wish I wish I had attended Oxford when you were here as well. It would have been quite an honor, a story to tell your grandchildren, perhaps. But also, um, you mentioned activism, uh, and that this is a big part of your life. Um, and you started campaigning at a very early age. So in 2008, in fact, when you were 11 year old, you started calling out the Taliban for preventing women from going to schools. This was at a time when Taliban had control of most rural parts of Pakistan. Uh, with the world seeing an 11-year-old stand up to this Taliban force, uh, a sort of new confidence was born uh, in a lot of young people that always were, felt like something is wrong but never sort of could stand up to it. What was the moment, what was that particular moment that at 11 years old that you just decided, okay, enough is enough, I'm gonna have to do something about it myself? We all have heard about um, the big uh, wars around the world, including the Cold War and the Soviet invasion and what was happening in Afghanistan. But those stories do not just stay limited to the news headlines. Those stories are actually impacting people's lives on the ground. And that radicalization that was happening there for a decade eventually flew into Swat Valley, which was my hometown. And in 2007, a group declared themselves the Pakistani Taliban, and they said that they would impose their own uh, Islamic system, a so-called Islamic system, where they wanted women to stay limited in their houses. They did not believe in girls' education. They did not believe in women doing any jobs. And, and they, did not, they did not want women to even be on the streets, going to markets. So, Women were banned, you would go to a street and there would be you know, a banner outside a shop which says women are not allowed. Schools were closed. At that time I was 10, 11 years old and I was very passionate about education. I wanted to study, I wanted to become a doctor, but things change too early. Um, and uh, the Taliban announced a ban on girls' education. I could not go to school, my friends could not go to school. And at that time, I had no option. I had to speak out because I could not imagine living in that extremism and terrorism forever. And some people were too scared to speak out because they're, you know, they were not putting their lives uh, on threat and they, uh, you know, they were not putting their lives in danger and they were worried that something would happen. But at the same time, silence was also costly. Silence meant that things would continue as they were and nothing was going to change. So my belief was that in order to change things, you have to speak out because things don't change, the, change themselves. Someone has to take that bold step and do it. And at that time, when you are you know, only 11 years old, you don't even know what to do. Um, so I started my activism with volunteering to speak to local media channels, uh, newspapers, TVs, and also the national and international media uh, channels as well, and that included the New York Times and BBC and CNN and others who were just coming into the valley and trying to ask people to uh, to say something about what was happening. And my dad and I and other a few other activists were willing to to say the truth. Um, speaking the truth is really important. And for me, uh, you know, it was simply just telling my story that this is a reality that is happening right now in this part of the world where girls are denied their right to education, where peace is just taken away from us. Uh, so this is where my activism started, but since then, 
you know? No, it's, it's yeah. exceptional because it's been uh, a long time uh, that, you know, well, a long time ago that you started and um, it has only been going, getting bigger and bigger and you're making more impact on a wider scale. Um, just like in terms of that uh, you started at the age of 11 and um, um, of course later on you got busier and busier with things. Have you ever found it difficult to sort of keep focused? I, I, I can imagine that it's sometimes um, sort of, you know, easy to almost slip into the influencer culture. Um, how do you keep the activism like effective once you've got on a platform? Sort of, how do you keep focus on the goal itself, something that you really believe in? I uh, became more focused on my campaign for girls' education because I realized that girls' education is not just an issue in one part of Pakistan, but it is a global issue. There is a global emergency for girls' education. Right now, 130 million girls do not have access to education. More than 20 million were at risk of dropping out because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And many girls are at risk of never returning to their schools because of climate-related events, including floods and droughts, because of which their schools are directly damaged or they get displaced and they stay away from their schools for a long period of time. And then there are other terrible things that are happening, including conflicts and wars. Uh, when we look at the case of Afghanistan, girls' secondary education is currently banned by the Taliban. So when you look at the reality of the world and what's happening with the education of the future generation, it, it, you know, it, it tells you that we cannot just stop and not do anything and, and just keep looking at, at it. Um, it's you know it's really important that we do something for it to, uh, to you know to, to ensure that all children can have this basic human right, yeah. which is to be able to access education. Yeah, I, I mean absolutely, and I think you mentioned a very like important aspect, like uh, the Afghanistan war that's going on right now. Uh, the Taliban regime has taken over. It's been a, a year since they took over. Um, what was what was your response to uh, the United States pulling out? As in, what was your stance uh, at that moment? I was actually in a hospital in the US. Um, I was going through another surgery, still like healing the scars of one bullet from the Taliban. Imagine the bullets that the people of Afghanistan have taken. Imagine the bullets that people in Pakistan have even taken because of the terrorism and extremism. And it is really unfortunate how uh, the name of Islam has been misused and exploited for uh, personal reasons and such radicalism has been spread. It's really important in this time that the world unites and they, uh, and, and, and the world stands up to protect human rights of women, of girls, of people, and they ensure safety to each and everyone. Uh, in Afghanistan right now, you know, this is, this is happening 20 years later once again. And this time things are different because women and girls have, have seen schools. They have seen what it means for women to be able to do work, to be able to get their education, to be able to feel empowered. Uh, and they cannot unsee that reality. They cannot see a different future for themselves right now. So they are out on the streets, on their roads, protesting for their rights. And that is something that gives me and women around the world hope that things will be a bit more different yeah. because of the pressure that they are building. And I hope that the international community defends the rights of Afghan women and girls. And they should ensure that the rights of women and girls are a non-negotiable condition for any conversation with the Taliban. And uh, it's also important in this time that Muslim countries stand up and defend girls' right to education because they clearly know that the Taliban are misusing the name of Islam, so it's really time for them to say that there are dozens of Muslim countries around the world. They do not prohibit women from going to schools or going to work. Uh, so it's, it's really important that they make a clear statement that no one can use that, you know, no one can use the religion to literally impose a ban on women uh, from working and you know and girls from education uh, so it's really important that we keep pushing yeah. leaders and those in positions of power to to take action in this time yeah no absolutely and i think uh, you're also uh, well i've heard that uh, you're working on uh, alternative means uh, ways of uh, educating these um, uh, young girls and young people in general in afghanistan 
Um, firstly, I would like to just generally know a bit more, uh, we'd like to just generally a bit know a bit more about this project that you're doing. But also, isn't it, uh, I wonder if it's difficult with, uh, to implement with the Taliban regime in there, uh, and how you make it work around that? Right now, there are so many Afghan activists uh, who are doing activism, they're finding alternative means of education as well. Some of the activists who we were supporting in Afghanistan are actually running these secret schools. They are teaching coding to girls, they're teaching computer skills to them, uh, and uh, you know, we are also in conversation with other prominent uh, figures there who are finding you know, ways in which they can use television as a learning source for the Afghan um, kids and, and they're using you know, mobile apps and, and other means as well to ensure that children keep learning. Uh, but this is, this is a challenging time. This is yeah. a challenging time because we know that alternative means can maybe assist the kids in the short term or uh, you know, they, they would work you know, with the assistance of formal in-school education as well. Uh, and at the same time, there is also a huge concern that, uh, you know, that the kids who are in the primary school uh, are actually not receiving quality education. So there are many reports which, uh, which uh, shows that the Taliban are actually trying to change the curriculum and limit, uh, you know, children's exposure to sciences and critical thinking. These are really important subjects because when you take away some of these important subjects, it does not remain education. It sort of becomes an indoctrination, and we don't want that for for children. Yeah, and I think I think we've seen that like uh, it happened in Pakistan as well um, some time ago, in that um, you know there is sort of informal education going on from the Taliban. But in Afghanistan, it's on more of central scale now that they have a whole government uh, by the Taliban. Um, what do you think, uh, what do you, I mean, foresee happening in this situation? One thing that I get a lot, uh, and I think us, like, generally individuals here wonder, how, what can we do to help in general? Like, you know, we all, a lot of us feel um, that this is a very uh, bad situation that th th those people are in, and wondering for ways that we could help out. And, um, but yeah, I, what, would you, what would be your advice on that? I think in this time, it's really important to go and talk to Afghan activists. And whichever country and cause and area you're worried about, go and talk to the people who are directly impacted by those problems. And you can join them and support them in their movement. And they will tell you how exactly you can support them. You can spread their message. You can raise more awareness about the issue. You can engage more friends and colleagues as well. Uh, you can invest in the work that they are doing. And, uh, and, and really stand with them because it's really, when you stand with them, they realize that they're not alone in, in this journey, that there are people who will be willing to support them. And here, you know, um, Oxford, I, I believe it's the best university in the world. So we have amazing people who uh, can, you know, who, are, who can not only provide, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, advice, et cetera, but they can actually go there and provide innovative and creative solutions. They can bring their skills and expertise and knowledge uh, and really go and, and help people to bring their ideas uh, into action. So yeah. do go out and, and, you know, and use your, uh, what you have. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and I think in these sort of situations, um, like a lot of the, uh, a lot of people look up to uh, institutions like the UN, uh, which is supposed to sort of mediate these things or alleviate these sort of problems. Um, the UN has been increasingly called into question for the ability to make real change or sort of change the status quo or things that as they are. How effective do you think the UN's role is today? And um, do you think the UN does enough to firstly support young people in these countries? Um, I mean, it might be a biased answer from you. No, since you're the just, UN. Uh, no like I, I spoke at the UN when I was 16 years old and at that time I had no idea, you know, what was, what was possible through that platform. And I have been very active in the advocacy that's done through the United Nations. And, you know, I studied IR as part of politics, so I can write, you know, a whole essay on this, uh, but I'm not gonna do that. I think, you know, <laughs> I have to do a lot of, I have to do like a long reading for that. I'm not ready. Uh, but I will say that, you know, there's always potential and possibility through these big international uh, forums. And if enough people are willing to come forward, they can make 
a significant change happen. We have good examples from the past as well. Uh, you know, the, when we are talking about gender equality um, and, and other issues, we have seen a significant change. So it is possible yeah. that we can make a huge difference going forward as well. On the UN, I would say it's really important for them to bring people who are directly impacted by the issues to the stage. They should not just be talking about you know, people who are in poverty, who are impacted by gender discrimination, whose education is currently banned just in, in numbers and figures. They can bring them to the state, so why not do that? And this year when I spoke at the UN, uh, I took girls with me to the stage and I insisted that, uh, you know, that, that they have to speak. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm currently 25, so I'm, I, you know, I would not call myself like a, you know, a young girl anymore. Um, and, and they need more young people there. And young people are just so, doing so much incredible work. They are uh, doing activism. They want change in their schools, in their workplace, in their community, in their, uh, in, 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 in their society. And they can advise you on what needs to be done for them. And uh, Vanessa Nakate, climate activist, she spoke there. A Ukrainian activist spoke there. And uh, Sumaya, an Afghan activist, spoke there. So I hope that you know, in, in that room, the leaders were able to hear directly from the girls how their decisions were going to impact them yeah. and how their inaction was going to impact them directly. You know, yeah. Uh, sometimes these you know, things at the UN and other big institutions take such a long time, it becomes so complicated, uh, and you know, sometimes for good, or for good reasons, but at the same time you realize like, people are, are suffering like, every day. So sometimes quick action is yeah. needed. Yeah. Um, you know, when you look at the, what's happening in Afghanistan, girls have been out of school for more than a year now. And if it becomes two years, three years, four years, many of those girls will, will never be able to complete their education. Uh, and that makes a huge difference in your life when you're not able to, uh, to complete your education. You miss on so many opportunities that education would have given you. So I hope that they take immediate action. And I personally will be using my role uh, to, to push for that. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think that sounds um, fantastic in that I completely agree with the point about uh, bringing uh, these people who've been firsthand affected by these problems because uh, it puts sort of it makes it more real the problem to you it's it's more human it's the human form uh, right there uh, usually we talk about it in figures we like poverty uh, exists in this level etc etc uh, but yeah that's that, that's a, that's a very uh, sort of an interesting point that the UN perhaps should consider and big institutions in general but similarly moving towards uh, sort of problems with uh, not just girls' education, but sort of like a problem with women's freedom. And like Iran, for instance, recently, uh, there, ha there, was, uh, th there are problems going on with women um, being asked to wear a hijab in their free speech. Uh, I wonder what sort of things uh, could be done to uh, sort of uh, support those, uh, that cause, um, and sort of what, what's your stance on that as to what you think would be good to do in this case? I admire the courage of all the Iranian women who are standing up for their right to choice. And I, I, you know, I stand with them, I support them, and they must know that they are, that they are not alone, that women around the world uh, are, are, are joining them in this, in this mission. It is every woman's right to decide what she wants to wear. There is, it's, it's, it should not be a state or a group of people telling women how they should dress, what they should wear, what they should not wear, and what is right and what is wrong in terms of their dress code or other things in their life. Uh, just as you know, we never tell men, you know, what is what is sort of a more acceptable dress code. Like why why impose that on women? It's really important that we uh, realize that it is it is about human liberty and human. Uh, freedom that they make those decisions for themselves it's it's so important and and it's really time that that Iran becomes the country that the Iranian women want it to be so it's you know it's it's the it's the right of the citizens to decide how their country should be treating them what their country should be providing them and that is something that you know we have literally just forgotten in the current day politics where 
states are just behaving so differently. It should be the other way around. State should be serving the people. State should be providing the basic needs to people. And, and um, so, I, so I hope that it really challenges the way we see things right now and really reminds us to question, you know, it's not just limited to Iran, it's, it's for you know, countries uh, in every corner of the world where states right now are denying women their rights, they are limiting their choices, and they are putting more pressure on their shoulders. They are limiting you know, women's, uh, women's just basic human rights, whether that's in America or in France or in other part of the world. It's really important that women's dignity and freedom is recognized in every corner of the world. No country can ask a woman what to wear, whether that is to tell them to wear a hijab or whether that is to tell them that they cannot wear a hijab, yeah. right? It's about the right to choose. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we, uh, it's good that you mentioned like the, the, the not wear the hijab problem as well because that exists here in, uh, in Europe, in France, where there is um, a ban, a burqa ban at the moment. So I think we're dealing with uh, quite a range of different issues um, and all sort of uh, aimed towards like, you know, what women can do and can't do. Um, but just uh, sort of moving on from the um, sort of the Iran um, issue and the situation that's going on there, um, and to the future endeavors and to things that you are um, planning to do. So, firstly, what is the most exciting thing that you're uh, planning to implement or do uh, in the near future going forward? The most exciting thing. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a difficult question, if I have to be honest. Um, I, I'm really excited about um, the production company that I have started. I, uh, it's called Extracurricular, and I currently partner with Apple TV+. Plus. I'm really excited to be uh, producing shows where, which are centered around the stories of women, and I believe that we need to give the opportunity of storytelling to more people who can come forward and tell us uh, how they see the world and and it's important for us to hear and see more perspectives and more point of views on our screens and ensure that we are uh, exposed to a diverse range of uh, of views and and it really helps us you know to to, to open our minds and to think uh, you know more openly so I'm really excited about that and you know some yeah. proje projects are in progress as well uh, so we'll hopefully see things on screen yeah. Um, yeah. Will we see you on screen in one of those? You can always see me on screen. You can just Google my name and just kidding. Yeah, no, but uh, I was going to actually ask about that because you called out uh, Hollywood for the lack of Muslim representation. Um, um, I, I presume that's something you'll aim to sort of um, implement in your new production company. But also, um, what? Uh, what sort of production, like, are you going to be, how, what's, what's going to be your involvement in it? So hopefully I'll be producing all sorts of shows, including like comedies, uh, documentaries, movies. And uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of entertainment. I grew up watching Bollywood uh, movies, Indian TV dramas, the Star Plus ones, and I <laughs> watch Cartoon Network. Uh, I was a big fan of like Courage the Cowardly Dog and Tom and Jerry and all of that. Uh, so, you know, those things influence you in so many ways. It shows you a whole different world. And, you know, what you see on screen, you sometimes question it. You know, is it how the world should be? Is it how the world should not be, should, should it be different? Uh, so I, I've learned so much from that and, uh, you know, when I was in university, I'm sure you, we all do that. Just before the deadline, I would just start binge watching a show. Uh, for me, it was, uh, it was the Big Bang Theory. I just got addicted to that. Uh, and uh, to be honest, that's how I lived my university life. Uh, and we're watching Friends and other TV shows. So. Same for most of us. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I'm not giving you like the best advice. Focus on your studies, guys. <laughs> Make sure you, you do your essays on time. Don't leave it to the last minute. Um, so, you know, you mentioned the, uh, the representation of like Muslim artists and, uh, and, and people from other backgrounds. It's really important. And 
Riz Ahmed is doing an incredible work on that. He started the Pillars Artists uh, Fellowship. Uh, so there are so many people who are already in the industry who are like, you know, they know that they are just a few from their community to get the opportunity to be there. So they're not taking it for granted. They are ensuring that they create space for others like them to get into the field and to uh, tell their stories. So. Uh, I hope that more and more people from all backgrounds uh, can can get the opportunity to share their stories on screen. Yeah, no, it sounds fantastic. And I have one last question before uh, we move it to the floor. Um, but uh, I, I believe it was last year, about two years ago, uh, I think about two years ago, you mentioned in a Vogue interview, in a comment, that I don't understand why people have to get married. Uh, uh, and it was it was slightly like taken out of context. There was some like you know uh, like some sort of backlash. But what was the context in, in the of the whole situation? I, I actually wrote an article on that as well uh, in Vogue. So uh, yeah. So <laughs> no, I think when I when I when I was interviewed for the British Vogue, uh, I was asked about marriage, and I said like. I, I did not know what like what to say actually, and it was such a heavy topic for me. Partly because of what I had seen in my you know in my childhood growing up, seeing how so many girls were forced into marriages, why you know how it was not even a choice for many of those girls. Uh, it was a decision taken by the family, told to girls that they cannot attend their school anymore, and and they're getting married. But also at the same time, uh, many of whom you know whatever age they got married at, they were told that now their choices were limited. They could not do a job and uh, and they had to live a completely different life. So just because of all of those reasons, I had concerns. So when I was asked about marriage, I was like, I'm not sure. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's an, I'm questioning the institution. I'm questioning the, uh, the patriarchy here. I'm questioning the stereo, you know, the, the stereotypical role that's expected. Um, so, and then six months later, I got married, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my husband is here, Asir Malik, over there, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it must have been challenging for him, you know, seeing my interview. <laughs> she doesn't want to get married, okay. Uh, <laughs> No, I think for me it was, and I, and I was really grateful that we had really uh, meaningful conversations together to discuss what marriage means to both of us and how it's about friendship, it's about companionship, it's about supporting each other in the things that we want to do in our life, uh, always standing by each other and, uh, and, and you know, just ensuring that we, we are in agreement that we are not expecting anything stereotypical, you know, from, from each other. Uh, and we realize that, you know, we have so much in common and we are uh, in agreement. Uh, so it's, you know, I think whatever we call it, marriage, partnership, whatever, I think it's about two people deciding to live together, to support each other and to ensure to give the best time to each other. So um, it's, it's really important that we question the institutions that we question, the systems around us. Um, you know, even if six months later we change our mind, that's okay. But it's important to question them. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that. <laughs> so we'll now open the floor to questions. Uh, um, and, uh, well, I recognize that member at the back there, yes. Yes. Um, first off, it's so wonderful to hear you speak. Malala, I last saw you when I was 13, and you came to surprise a bunch of Dubai residents at a premiere for your movie, he named me Malala, so it's great to see you here now. Uh, my question also relates to your future endeavors. Um, many, many years ago, before you joined university, you voiced um, dreams of becoming the next uh, Pakistani prime minister. Um, and I wondered if an entry into Pakistani politics is still on the table for you, and it's something that you're considering, given in your interview with Vogue last year, you, you mentioned feeling a little aimless about what to do next. So does Pakistani politics look like something you might do next? Thank you so much uh, for the question. Um, 
I would say uh, right now my focus is girls' education and most of us when we talk about politics and when we talk about becoming prime minister and president, it's always the urge to make change that drives us to that decision. When I was 11 years old, when I saw that extremism in Swat Valley and when I realized that politicians were just so inactive and they were so slow in reacting, I decided at age 11 that I want to become a prime minister. So, uh, you know, my hope was that, you know, I could, I could just go and fix the country, hopefully. But, at, you know, with time you realize that there are limitations. And, you know, in the end, if you want change, whatever profession, career, job you pick, you can make that change happen through that. Uh, and we, you know, it, it's all about activism. So whatever your profession you, you take, you can still be an activist. And, Activism is the most important thing to me. I hope that I see that day in my lifetime where all girls can have access to quality education and uh, where we say like zero girls are out of school. So that is something that I want to see in my lifetime. Um, and regarding you know becoming prime minister, I don't know what's the average age, so I'm sure I have a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, I recognize the member at the front there, yes. Just the one in the middle, the black top. Yeah. Well, either of them. I'm going to be very aggressive about this and take this away from you, even if <laughs> I think it was originally me. So, Could you please speak louder? Yes. Um, as a Cambridge student, I have to respectfully disagree that Oxford is the best institution in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but Malala, I am very glad to be here today to hear you speak, and I am so incredibly inspired. My question um, is twofold, but you know, I'll just take one. Um, how do you deal with the pressure of being one amongst the disadvantaged or marginalized community that you represent with the platform? Um, how do you deal with the discomfort, if there is any for you? How do you deal with perhaps the injustice, because there are so many that are unheard? And um, is part of your new adventure into popularizing women's voices from diverse backgrounds um, related to that sentiment at all? Thank you so much, and I think we can deb debate about you know which university is better later. But uh, coming to your main question, uh, for me, I realized the potential of the platform uh, that I have from a very early age, and I realized that you know I have this you know I had this opportunity to speak at a lot of these big platforms and and and, and stages many times. Now it's time that. I bring the voices of other women and girls uh, to the platform. So when I meet a president and prime minister of a country, I ensure that an activist from that country goes with me. And most of those activists are usually not given a chance to sit in that room uh, and, and to ask questions from, uh, from the leaders directly. I remember when I was in Nigeria, and we were speaking with the vice president, the activists who uh, went with me to the meeting later told me that, you know, this may never have happened, but they get the opportunity to ask directly from their leaders and then stay in touch with them to really hold them accountable. And when I speak at the UN uh, and other platforms, I ensure that, you know, if I'm given 10 minutes to speak, I speak for two minutes and introduce other activists who can then speak and share their own story because I know that you know that they can say it better than me. They can tell them. They can tell everyone in uh, in that room directly what is happening in their life, rather than uh, me telling their story. While you know, while they could be just there on the stage themselves. And it's important that we all recognize what we can do for others. Sometimes you know, because we have been in a position where our voices have been silenced or denied, we you know, once we get that opportunity, we have to reflect on that opportunity and ensure that we look around ourselves and, 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 uh, and make sure that if there are others who do not have a voice, who are not given a platform, that we bring them forward. We give space to them as well. So this is like a huge and, and an important part of my activism. Um, um, 
when I talk about Afghan act uh, advocacy, um, you know, the Afghan activists are, are always there in those rooms, in those discussions, and, uh, and they ask questions directly uh, from, from leaders. We uh, called uh, a meeting of the feminist foreign policy countries, and Afghan activists all were there, girls, other activists as well, and, and they really challenged the leaders in that room about their commitment to like a feminist foreign policy and how they were just acting like any other country. They were challenged to show what it means to have a feminist foreign po uh, policy in your country and what more they can do for Afghan girls. And, uh, and, and, and they spoke so powerfully in that room. Uh, so you know, this, is, this is really crucial to me to do that. Thank you very much. Um, I, I recognize that member back there. All right, I just, uh, before my question, I just want to say Oxford is the best. <laughs> um, so my name is Wont. Uh, it's a pleasure seeing you again, uh, Malala. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, being part of your position with you at the UN and also uh, with the uh, Play International uh, intensive work with girls and women as well. And one of those things that I do admire is uh, the work you did with the award at school with Gordon Brown. And activations are very, very incredible for you, very passionate for you, especially working for the specific cause. In terms of the students here at Oxford who are from diverse background, different professions, incredible leaders with amazing story, how can you integrate your work uh, in terms of finding purpose inspiring them to be able to follow parallel line for uh, global change or sustainability around our world. If you would say one word to a student or specific word of inspiration, what would you lead uh, to the students here from Oxford and different universities? Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Do you wanna, do you wanna have, uh, say the, repeat the precise like, question part of that, please? So um, the question is basically like, um, given your experience and background, how can you rally students here from different backgrounds to find a common purpose for humanity? Could be through the sustainable development goals or through different fields as well. Um, in, so in terms of like the work that I do, um, for me personally, it is supporting other activists who are doing the work on the ground. When we talk about girls' education, it is, it is a global issue. And it's happening in different parts of the world where girls are denied the right to education or they're not given the quality education uh, and, and the facilities that they need in order to stay in school. So most girls drop out of their schools uh, at, at some stage in their life because of the lack of infrastructure and facilities or because of social norms as well. So the things that girls, the issues that girls face in Brazil are very different to the issues that girls face in Afghanistan and then the issues that girls face in Nigeria. So for us, it was really important to ensure that we have a bottom-up approach where we work with the local activists who identify the problems and the barriers that girls are facing and uh, ensure that they have solutions addressing those problems. And local activists already have NGOs, they're already doing the work on the ground and they need more support uh, and resources to make their work um, available on a bigger scale to reach to more girls, to make it more effective as well. And that's the model that we have at the fund. So we currently work in nine countries. We, have, uh, we are reaching up to 100 activists right now. Uh, we are supporting activists in, in Pakistan, in Brazil, in, Af in Afghanistan, in India, in Nigeria, in Ethiopia, and in so many other countries where they are uh, doing advocacy to change policies, including passing a legislation in the state of Kaduna in Nigeria to uh, get rid of the hidden school fees and make education completely free for students by law. And uh, they are also providing alternative means of learning as well, uh, including the work that Harun Yaseen is doing through Talimabad in Pakistan where they are providing educational content on, uh, you know, on, through technology, through television, and other means as well. And 
these activists are also doing research work uh, by which they are showing us the stats and figures and they're making recommendations to the policymakers on what they need to do for uh, girls' education to make it a, you know, a quality education for all girls. Uh, so, and a lot of these activists are engaging with the local communities as well, really convincing parents and, uh, and local community leaders to understand education in the local context. <coughs> I think I'm getting like cough or something when I go from here. So. No. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is the way that we do our work. It's more sort of locally led, but also we do advocacy on the global level as well, using the global platforms, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunities that are there at the G7, G20, the Global Partnership for Education, the UN and other platforms as well, to really, you know, have a really holistic approach in making a change happen. Um, you know, if you want to see change around the world for every girl, then this is, this is a huge task and you have to work in all directions from, from all sides as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, anyone upstairs that wants to ask a question? Um, yes, I recognize that member there. Um, sort of by nature of your incredible story and work, you've become an inspiration to millions of people around the world. Who would you say inspired you when you were younger, when you were sort of coming into being such an important global figure? Are there any people that you really looked up to and sort of tried to model yourself on? Thank you so much uh, for the question. I was you know, 10 years old when I first uh, appeared in front of a camera and when I first uh, shared my story. At that time, the person who inspired me was my father, Ziauddin Yusufzai. He was the person who I was the closest to, who I could see, you know, in, in, in my home doing activism for women's rights, for peace in Swat Valley. And uh, he was a dedicated person for, for, you know, for as long as I can remember him. He was always in action doing something. And he's a person who doesn't just talk about things. He believes that, you know, that is, there's no time to talk about it. You have to do something about it. When uh, I was born, it was, um, you know, a good news for him. But for many family members, the news was that, oh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a girl again. It's not a boy. And uh, my father was, was really proud that he had a daughter. And he, uh, even, even when he was deciding to name me, he decided to name me after Malala of Maywand, which is this Afghan uh, heroine, because he believed that we need to have more, you know, women known by their own name. It, because in our culture, sadly, we do not have that many women in our history who are known by their own names, and women are usually not even referred to by their own name. So uh, he wanted to challenge that. Uh, so I was inspired by him because of the way he was treating his sisters and my mom, and he was like, he was sort of different than others. And when, you know, you can be preached about all of these things, you can be told, you know, this is right, this is wrong. But what really influences you and impacts you is action that you see around you, around you by your family members, by your colleagues, by your friends, uh, and that that says a lot. And uh, he, you know, he inspired me uh, through his actions. But other than that, like I have, I have met so many incredible people around the world, especially right now when I do my advocacy, I go to different countries, um, in, you know, including Iraq, Nigeria. Kenya, Brazil, I meet these incredible young activists who are not afraid, who are not giving up, who are who understand the urgency uh, and they are taking action. They are speaking out for climate justice, they are speaking out uh, for, um, for reproductive health and rights, they are also challenging uh, people who are, you know, oppressive and who are denying women their rights. They're talking about mental health and other issues. And, and I'm really proud of the activism that young people are doing right now, including Vanessa Nakate and Greta Thunberg and, and many other incredible girls who are just reminding us that, you know, we should not just, you know, 
tell ourselves as if you know the world is a perfect place right now. There are so many things that are happening right now that will impact us and our future generations if we do not take take action right now. Whether that is climate justice or uh, or wars and conflicts or the protection of human rights. Yeah. No. Thank you very much. We'll take last uh, two more questions and uh, we'll finish. Um, we'll have a question from the member here first. You sort of touched on this on your last response, and earlier you mentioned the impact of climate disasters on women's education. In what ways do you think that climate change will shape your activism in the future and the women's rights movement more generally? So just um, recently we did a study at Malala Fund which shows that up to 12.5 million girls are at risk of dropping out of school because of climate-related events in 2025. So when we talk about climate disasters like floods and droughts, we should not just talk about them in isolation. They are directly impacting women and girls, and they are impacting girls' education as well. It's important that we remind ourselves that, you know, that, it's, that all of these other issues that we talk about, poverty, gender discrimination, social norms, and, uh, and, and climate change, all of these issues directly impact girls and, and why they drop out and why they're not receiving quality education in their schools. Uh, so it's really important, uh, it, you know, in the work that we do. Uh, we all have heard about the recent floods in Pakistan. I was able to visit Karachi just a week or two ago and uh, visit one of the refugee camps. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, I, I visited the, this, this informal settlement where women and, and girls were, were just completely hopeless. They were asking for basic needs, and I met a girl. Um, she uh, was in grade 10. She was worried about her education because in this place, she was, you know, they did not even have a school for, for children, um, and you know, children were just limited to like basic things like you know, just drawing and, uh, and, and primary level uh, literacy. Uh, girls were not able to have their secondary education and she has a dream to become a doctor and do something for her family, but it is not possible for her because there is, there is no focus given to education, unfortunately, when it comes to providing uh, aid. Uh, you know, oftentimes it's about the urgent needs, and education is not treated as, you know, as part of the emergency. It's really important that we challenge that. Uh, the longer a child, especially a girl, stays out of school, the harder it is for her to, to go back. So it's important that we think about long-term solutions as well. And in the long term, we have to invest in the safe and quality education of children to ensure that we create climate resilient economies going forward. So girls' education and education and quality education for all children acts as, a, as one of the most sustainable, effective solutions uh, for climate change and other issues as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And just the last uh, final question. Uh, I choose that, uh, can I recognize that member at the back? Well, whilst we wait for the, for the question, uh, your friend, you're good friends with uh, Greta Thunberg, I believe. Yes. Uh, we've heard a lot of uh, rumors about Greta coming to Oxford. Is she actually coming to Oxford or is that? You know, I, I even asked her this time. I saw Greta just um, two days ago. And I told her, I said, I strongly recommend you apply to Oxford. So I, I, am, I am the best ambassador of <laughs> Oxford University, doing it all for free. So yeah, if she applies, you know, I'll, I'll take all the credit. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, thank you. My name is Koshika. Thank you so much for being here. It's been amazing listening to you. Uh, my question to you is kind of stemming from what you were speaking about you and, and, and you know, some of the issues within that. Uh, when we talk about the violence, crimes against humanities in Afghanistan, one of the other actors in the violence perpetuated by them that we don't talk about, and I would love to know your views on, is the US forces, right? And almost the attempt by the United States of America to immobilize the International Criminal Court recently and to prevent the investigation from going ahead, which also hampers girls' education along with other basic hum human rights uh, for, for Afghani citizens. And I would love to know your views on that and how do you think we can uh, address uh, political clout created by, you know, big nations like this and the violence uh, and prevent impunity in the crimes that they have committed. Thank yeah. you. 
Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, it's important to hold everyone accountable. Um, and it's important that we do our advocacy and our activism on every level. Each state uh, has a responsibility to defend and protect human rights. Uh, and, you know, whether that's the United States or uh, the UK or Pakistan or Saudi Arabia or any other country, it's, you know, it's really, but I will say that, you know, sometimes in the world of activism, it's all focused on like Western countries uh, or, you know, it's, to be honest, like it, it is, it's really hard to control narrative. It's really hard to control the messaging and especially in the world of social media, before you know it, uh, you know, a perspective is already spreading, a narrative is already spreading. Uh, so it's, it's, it's important for us, especially in the world of social media, that we uh, take a pause and really think about things more holistically and, uh, and have a bigger picture of what's happening and realize that we all can play a different role in the activism we all have different opportunities, different platforms that we can use. Uh, we can support other activists. We can become the voice of an issue that we strongly feel about. We can, um, you know, we can we can do our our own bit. We can question those, you know, in our own constituencies, uh, and we can like mobilize groups and we can do protests on the streets as well. So it's really understanding like what role you can play. And I would say that, you know. Let's support, like, let's appreciate everyone who's who's doing their bit. Um, I, you know, I, I usually don't say, like, you know, some if someone is doing enough or not, or someone is doing it the right way or the wrong way. I think we are, you know, we all uh, should try to do the best that's in our capacity. Um, but just in terms of, like, the vision that I see for the world, I hope that we ourselves uh, become more active in creating a world that is more equal, fairer for, for everyone, that we see a world where education is the right uh, of every child and it's given to them, where no girl is denied the right to school, and uh, where we ensure that every child has access to safe education. Uh, Ahmed, you know, we are, we are here sitting on the stage together, but we have so much in common in our stories. Uh, you know, what happened in December 2014 where a school was attacked and more than 130 children were killed, many injured, many just went through an unimaginable trauma of what they saw on that day. And uh, we have so many stories of children facing violence and extremism in their schools, in their, uh, in, you know, in their neighborhoods. Uh, and, and that needs to change. Education is the basic human right of every child. Um, and uh, it's, you know, let's, let's make it happen. Let's make it possible that, uh, that we see a world where every child can go to school safely without any fear and they receive the quality education that they deserve. Um, and, uh, and I hope that we see that in our lifetime. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say, and I was going to say this before the event as well, that it is an absolute honor uh, for all of us that you are here today. Uh, you have inspired millions of people. The sincerity that you speak with is inspiring. Uh, we, all, we all, as the chamber and I as the president, uh, wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. And we'll hopefully see you soon in the union as well. Yeah, thank you very much.